Matthew 22, verse 41, through to Matthew 23, verse 12. What an exciting passage it is. Uh, The Pharisees and the Herodians had been in this temple area trying to catch Jesus out over paying taxes. Then the Sadducees had stepped into the conflict trying to tie Jesus up in knots with pointless conundrums and theology. And now Jesus turns the questions onto them. And as we'll see in chapter 23, he then goes on to very publicly rebuke them in front of his disciples, in front of the crowds. And and remember, the Pharisees, we know from history, they were well-loved and well-respected people in this day. In this context, I think we could often paint a picture of the Pharisees being like villains But actually, they were seen as the best Jews around. They were pure. They were devout. So this would have been quite shocking what is unfolding in today's reading and what unfolds as we move into the seven woes that follow our reading today. So Jesus asks them, he says, who is the Christ? Whose son is the Christ? Um, the Messiah. And honestly, I think Jesus is still in this moment giving them an opportunity to see him for who he really is. He's planting a little seed of revelation in their hearts in the hope that that would awaken, that they'd really press in. They give the correct theological answer. They say the Christ, the Messiah, is the son, the direct descendant of David. Correct. Jesus then says, well, hang on, if the Messiah is David's son, bear in mind the hierarchy and lineage and age value in this culture. The father was seen as greater than the son, the grandfather greater than both the father and the son, the great grandfather greater than those afterwards. Even if that great grandfather was dead, he was still held in highest honour. That was the culture. So if the Messiah is David's descendant, well, how come David called the Messiah Lord? How could he use that title of his descendant? Because that would imply, well, I mean, it would imply two things. Firstly, it would imply that David's son and heir was also going to become his Messiah, his Redeemer, his Saviour and ultimately his King. And secondly, if you think about it, for that to happen, there would have to be some sort of end time resurrection where David is raised and then David bows to the Christ, the Messiah, his descendant. Of course, as we've just been reading, the Sadducees had been denying that Old Testament promise of resurrection. So it's a super clever revelation that Jesus is bringing into this. And what I find particularly shocking about this invitation by Jesus to the Pharisees to discover his true identity as the son of God, the the divine origin, both as the descendant of David and the creator and originator of David. What I find shocking is that the Pharisees were silent. They didn't ask for an explanation. They didn't press in like the disciples. They weren't willing to humble themselves and admit that they did not know it all. They were just all too concerned about their reputation. I hope we have the humility to learn from one another. We then move into chapter 23, um, the seven woes. Jesus, in front of these religious leaders, in front of the crowds, he starts to publicly teach about the Pharisees. And he says they are hypocrites. They tell you what to do, but they don't do it themselves. He says that they... Uh, The stuff that they do is all for the applause and recognition of men. Now, in some church circles, and I'm very aware of the irony of what I'm about to say, but in some church circles, some church leaders feel that, um, that passages like this are justification to go around pointing out the flaws in others, to call them out because they're speaking the truth like Jesus did here. Well, maybe, maybe. But I think if we're going to do that, then I think there are a few lessons here from the passage, a few checks and balances. Firstly, are we ourselves practicing what we preach? Are we living it out? Did we break any COVID rules? Have we only told the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? 
Have we sought to remove the plank from our own eye before using social media to point out the speck in someone else's eye? Otherwise, perhaps we are being hypocrites too. Secondly, in our actions, whose applause and recognition are we doing it for? Now, the Pharisees, they, um, they, I suppose like all good Jews, they had these little wooden boxes, two little wooden boxes. Inside the boxes were a piece of scripture, the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And these two little boxes had these leather straps and those straps were used to bind the box to the hand and to the forehead. But what the Pharisees had done in this day was to make those phylacteries massive. Whoa, look at the size of his phylacteries. I'm sorry, but I think Jesus is using a bit of humour here. Uh, look at them. Look at how impressive they are because of their religious garments. There may be times when we as Christians use something like social media to speak out against injustice. There may even be times where we are led to speak out against the unjust actions of a person, of an individual or a group. But let's not do it for the likes or for the public recognition. I feel that is something at the heart of what Jesus is saying here. And let's actually use the injustice and the things in the world that just don't seem right. Let's use it to provoke us to examine our own hearts and to root out hypocrisy first in us and amongst God's people. Amen.